Uh, good afternoon to everybody attending in Europe and good morning to those of you joining from North America. Um, welcome to the next installment of Contract Conversations. Uh, today we're going to take a look at a couple of legal doctrines that are important in contract law, misrepresentation and mistake. So both of these are useful things to know about and have on your radar if you find yourself in a situation where the terms of a contract that you've agreed to are, are not in your favour for some reason, as either of these concepts may give you a basis for not having to perform the contract in that kind of situation where the terms and not in your favour. So before we before we begin, and uh, just by way of introduction, I'm Eric France. I'm a commercial disputes partner at Mills and Reeve, and I specialise in helping people resolve disputes under commercial contracts. And over to you, Mark, to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Davison. I'm the head of international arbitration here at Mills and Reeve. Uh, traditionally help clients with contractual disputes, but uh, traditionally in uh, in arbitration forums. So very quickly, uh, before Mark's, Mark kicks off, um, we are recording this. Uh, it is going to be available on our website later. We also have a um, Q&A function. So um, please do type any questions you have into the Q&A box, um, either while we're presenting or at the end. We've got around 100 people or so uh, with us today, um, but we'll try to deal with as many questions as possible at the end. And if we, uh, if we don't get to your, your, your query, we will uh, try to follow up with you separately via LinkedIn or, or by email. Okay, over to you, Mark. Okay. Eric, so um, I'm just going to quickly cover um, what, what misrep is and what comprises misrepresentation and then look at sort of practical ways that you can try either avoid being sued for misrepresentation or what to do if you're a victim of misrepresentation. So just very simply, all misrepresentation is, is basically where someone has made an untrue or misleading statement of fact or law um, during the negotiations, uh, which has then induced you to enter into a contract with that party. There are three main types of misrepresentation. There's uh, innocent misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation, and then there's also fraudulent misrepresentation as well all of which have varying uh, remedies. There is also negligent misstatement as well, which I'll briefly touch on as well. So in terms of like, who can make a misrepresentation, so it can be made obviously by the individual that you're entering into a contract with or by the employee or the officer of um, a, a director, effectively of the entity that you're entering into a contract with. Uh, it can also be made by an agent, provided that they're acting within the scope of their authority. And then it can also be made by a third party who isn't an agent, but who the representor knows has made a misrepresentation. So in terms of what amounts to a misrepresentation, I think we all know that when contracts are being negotiated, a lot of things are said, and some of that can be treated as mere sale, sales puff. Um, often some things which are said will go into the contract itself. So if somebody says that they can deliver services or works by a certain date, that's usually provided for in the contract. And if they're breached, then uh, it may be actually easier just to bring your contractual claim uh, for breach of contract. It, it's probably going to be easier to prove evidentially. But some things are said which can be relied upon by parties to induce them into a contract, which are not strictly covered in the contract itself. And so the question is, what happens if that turns out to be untrue? So when determining whether there's been a misrepresentation, what a court looks at is first, was there a representation made as to fact or law which wasn't true? Did the representor know that wasn't true or were they negligent when making that statement regardless of whether it was true or not? And if so, was there reliance on that representation by the party who was induced to enter into the contract? And then when it's gone through those, it then just looks at is there a clause in the contract which tries to limit liability for misrepresentation? And then finally, it looks as to what loss you've suffered. So just trying to unpack each of those in turn. So how can a misrepresentation be made? So generally, um, misrepresentations that we probably come across more often than not are those where it's made expressly, either orally or in writing. Um, and so, and you rely on that written statement or oral statement um, when you enter into the contract. So a good example there is uh, B Sky B, which I put on the slide there. 
Um, that's where an IT contractor said that they could deliver works by a certain time scale. And it turned out that they knew that they, there was no chance that they had. So that was a, a misrepresentation claim. Um, I should just say that sort of if somebody makes a misstatement of opinion rather than as to actual specific facts or law, which then pr proves to be unfounded, that generally won't be a misrepresentation. Um, and so a good example of that was the RBS Chandra case, which is there on the screen, where the Court of Appeal held that a husband's over optimistic assessment of his business didn't amount to a misrepresentation which entitled his wife to have a guarantee set aside. Um, I appreciate there's probably some awkward conversations there between the husband and the wife. Um, in terms of um, the second point there on the slide about implied statements or conduct, so you can actually have misrepresentations which are made by implied statements of conduct. And what the court does is they look at such conduct or implied statements and see what on an objective basis, a reasonable representee would have naturally assumed the true state of the facts to have been um, and whether it was necessarily informed of those facts. Um, I think a good case of where a, um, a misrepresentation has been implied by conduct is the case there involving Eric's favorite pop group, Spice Girls, uh, where it was held that basically the Spice Girls had made an implied misrepresentation when they continued with arrangements to publicise uh, their counterparty's products, when they actually knew that Jerry Halliwell was about to leave the band, which meant that actually they couldn't, um, they couldn't actually carry out their contractual obligations under the contract. In terms of whether silence can be a misrepresentation, generally no, um, silence does not usually amount to a misrepresentation. There's no duty to disclose facts, um, but there can be an obligation to speak up. If, um, for example, you've made a half truth. So what I mean by that is uh, you said something which is technically true, but is technically untrue by virtue of what you've left unsaid. Um, where a party um, makes a statement which is true, but then it becomes false by the, before the contract is entered into. And then also where there are duties of good faith for, for the parties to act in good faith to each other. So you know, those of you that deal with insurers will be well aware of the duty of fidelity to disclose all material facts to an insurer. Um, I should just say that in terms of misrepresentation claims, obviously a lot of things are said when you're entering into a contract. The, the, the misrepresentation that you're complaining of doesn't need to be the sole statement which induced you into the contract. But what you have to show is that that, that mistake, sorry, that misrepresentation materially influenced you to enter into the contract. So what I mean by that is that it had a real and substantial impact on your judgment of whether to enter into the contract. The test changes slightly for fraudulent misrepresentation. And, and, and in those cases, it's a bit of a lesser standard. You just have to show that it was in your active consideration when you're entering into the contract. Um, but it should just be said, when you're looking at these misrepresentation claims, you, you don't have to take reasonable steps to, you know, of, of what's said to you to work out whether that's true or not. Um, the authority for that there is the PK decision, which is on the slide. So just looking at, I said at the start, I talked about the, uh, the three different types of misrepresentation and negligent misstatement. Just briefly looking at those in turn. So fraudulent misrepresentation, that's where a false representation is made knowingly or without belief in its truth or reckless in its truth. And so fraudulent, fraudulent misrepresentation uh, derives from sort of the common law and the tort of deceit. Um, Proving fraud is a high obstacle to overcome, uh, although a representee can bring claim for misrepresentation in circumstances where the representor only suspected that their statement might be incorrect, and then they didn't take any proper checks to make sure that it was true. Um, just practically though, before you start alleging fraudulent misrepresentation, you might just wanna consider what the defendant's financial position is. And the reason for that is if you don't think that they're good for the money and what you're seeking to actually do is try and recover against an insurance policy that they've got, then you might just want to think carefully before alleging fraudulent misrepresentation, because as I think as many of us will know, a lot of insurance policies won't cover claims for fraud.
Um, also, if you're a director of a company that's alleged to have made a fraudulent misrepresentation, then you can assume that the company itself will be liable for the fraudulent misrepresentation. But you should just know that company directors can be personally liable for fraudulent misrepresentation. And that's because they're liable not as a director, but as an individual that's committed fraud. And so similarly, um, fraudulent misrepresentation can actually be an offence under the Fraud Act 2006. So it's certainly something just to be alive to if you're um, the, the party that's making representations for another party to rely upon when entering into a contract. Uh, just really quickly then, in respect of negligent misrepresentation and innocent misrepresentation. So negligent misrepresentation, it's a lesser standard than fraudulent misrepresentation. Um, all you need to show is that the, um, the, the false statement was made either carelessly or without reasonable grounds for believing in its truth. Um, you only actually need to show that the statement was incorrect because then it's for the representor to try and establish the, the basis of why they believed uh, that the statement was true and that such belief was reasonable. Innocent misrepresentation is slightly different in the fact that it's it's where a representation is made, but on no fault of uh, on the part of the representor. So, uh, for example, they've made a statement which turns out to be false, but the representor genuinely believed it was true at the time that they made the statement. Um, in respect to negligent misstatement, I said it works slightly differently, and it works slightly differently because Basically, in those types of claims, it, the representative has to owe some form of duty of care to the representee, and then they make a false statement carelessly to the representee. And unlike negligent misrepresentation, uh, the contract doesn't actually have to be entered into as a result. But because of that, there is no right of rescission of the contract as a remedy. And so what you do is you effectively calculate damages for such a claim. But effectively, you have to see what was the, the loss that was reasonably foreseeable um, as a result of the misstatement when you're calculating the damages that you're entitled to. So I put there on the screen uh, just a quick box of the types of remedies that are available for the, uh, the different types of misrepresentation. And I've also just included their breach of contract just for your, your shopping list as well. Um, so just really quickly, rescission, what we mean by rescission is that effectively the, the contract is unraveled uh, to try and put the party back in the position they would have been had they not actually entered into the contract itself. I should just say that you know, as well as rescission, actually, as a claimant, you've got the ability to try and affirm a breach as well. So you don't have to have the contract rescinded. And then in respect of damages, if the court awards damages, what they seek to do is try and put the party that's harmed in the financial position uh, they would have been had the misrepresentation not been made. And that's slightly different to damages awarded for breach of contract, where it seeks to put the claimant in the financial position they would have been had the breach not occurred. So the difference in approach can actually make a material effect on the amount of damages which are awarded. Um, I should just add, as always, if you are a claimant, then you've always got your duty to mitigate any losses that you suffer as well. So just looking at sort of practical tips to try and avoid uh, misrepresentation claims and what to do if you're sort of the victim as well. I'm sure I speak to I'm sure I speak for everybody on this call that, that, that no one likes to have failed thought or that they've misled anyone to enter into a commercial agreement. Um, but in, if you look at these types of tips here, it can try and help you fall foul of a misrepresentation claim, whether being um, alleged to have committed a misrepresentation or actually being a victim. So the, the first point there is effectively, can you limit liability for misrepresentation? And in short, you can. I think we've all seen entire agreement clauses and non-reliance clauses in contracts. And they will generally be enforceable, but provided that they are clear, clearly drafted and they're unambiguous. There are lots of cases out there where such clauses have failed. So if you are the party which is making representations, make sure you do have an exclusion clause in such as an entire agreement clause or a non-reliance clause. But make sure to take careful review of those uh, just to make sure that they are clear and they cover what representations of, uh, you're trying to cover off with such a clause. 
I appreciate they are often boilerplate clauses and, and people don't really take much notice of them, but they can be key. Um, and just very finally, I put there about the um, section three of MISREP Act and um, UCTERM. So they, they have to be reasonable within the meaning of section three of the MISREP Act and the Unfair Contract Terms Act. Um, and just also be aware that obviously it won't cover you for fraudulent uh, misrepresentation on the basis of the fraudulent nature of the allegation being made. So if you're entering into a contract, then ensure that you're fully aware of the terms that you're signing up to. Um, you might just want to consider what your employees are actually saying when you're when they're negotiating a contract. You shouldn't assume that they necessarily are going to be covered by a contractual limitation clause. And so actually you may want to train staff involved in sales and the uh, pre-contract negotiations so that they're aware of the implications of making false statements, um, both on the business and potentially on themselves. And, and also you might just want to actually review all your marketing team materials as well. So your presentations, your leaflets, your website, your sales brochures, just to ensure that they are fact checked and don't contain any uh, language which is false. And you might actually want to diarise check that at regular intervals. If you're a party with specialist knowledge and your counterparty doesn't have that knowledge, then again, I'd, I'd say to take care in what you're saying and make sure that the other side understands what is being said. If it's possible, try and document in writing um, any representations which are, ma are made so that you're not having a fight later on about what was said orally. Um, and if prior to entering into a contract, you learn that something is true, then obviously tell your um, counterparty as soon as possible before the contract is entered into. Uh, and I'd say make sure that you've got a written note of that. And then and very finally, obviously, if you are alleged to have committed a misrepresentation, then seek legal advice as soon as possible before you respond. Um, it, you, you don't want to inadvertently say something which may come back to haunt you later. And then similarly, if you, you think that you have been the victim of a misrepresentation, then again, seek legal advice. As we've seen the law on misrepresentation can be a little bit tricky. So making sure that you articulate what the misrepresentation is and how you've been impacted about that at the outset is very important. Uh, and so that's misrepresentation in a nutshell. Uh, I think Eric is now going to cover mistake. All right, thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to give you a bit of a shopping list of things to think about, um, particularly if the terms of the contract um, don't help you and you, you're trying to find a way of escaping liability for, the, for those, those terms. And so one way of doing that might be if you can point to some kind of relevant mistake in the way the contract was made. So we're looking here at circumstances where a mistake was made in the making of the contract which means that a party can claim that the contract is void and he or she is therefore released uh, from any obligations under the contract, such as to pay money or, uh, or deliver a service. So if you make a claim of mistake, what you're doing is you're attacking the validity of the contract on the basis that there wasn't uh, proper consent to the contract. Since contracts depend on the consent of both parties for their, leg their legitimacy, um, so the mistake doctrine is similar in that respect to some other uh, uh, legal doctrines like, like misrepresentation that Mark's just covered, which attacks the consent to the contract on the basis that one party was induced into entering into it by something the other party said, which was not true. It's also a bit similar to frustration, which is all about arguing that some event that's happened post-contract was so outside what the parties to the contract could ever have foreseen that it would be wrong to make the parties continue to perform the contract from, and so the, the contract is treated as being terminated from the, from the moment of that frustrating event. So it's a bit similar to those things, but, but mistake is different um, because it attacks the making of the contract. If you can establish a mistake, the contract is void from the beginning as if it never existed. And it's not just voidable, um, as in the case of uh, negligent or fraudulent misrepresentation. So, so with, with those kinds of misrepresentation, the party can elect whether or not to, to, um, to uh, rescind the contract. Whereas with mistake, the contract is void from the start um, and there's no, there's, no, there's no election. So um, 
Also, unlike misrepresentation, mistake is purely a shield and not a sword. So even if you can establish that there's been the relevant kind of mistake, you can't claim damages from the other party. You can only make the contract void. Um, so because mistakes aren't legal wrongs, they're mistakes, you know, um, they're, 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 not, they're not legal wrongs in the same way that misrepresentations are. So the next point on the slide is that um, only relevant kinds of mistakes count. Um, so many mistakes that parties might make will have no impact at all on a contract. So the, the, the main policy that the courts apply here is that they will hold people to their bargains. The idea of letting people off the hook because of a mistake is an exception to that policy. So it's very tightly controlled by the courts. The court will uphold the bargain made by the parties despite misunderstandings as to things like the contract wording or its legal effect, um, the law, um, their, the party's underlying rights before they made the contract, uh, or, the, or the commercial benefits to the parties of entering into the agreement. Uh, in other words, uh, making a, uh, somebody making a bad bargain. Those, those are the most common types of mistakes that people actually make when they enter into contracts, and the courts will not let you off the hook if you make, if you make those kinds of mistakes. The, a, a, instead, it has to be the relevant kind of mistake, and a contract can be voided under common law rules for a mistake um, only in, in the following situations. The, the first one that's up there on the slide is a common mistake. So this is where the mistake is shared by both parties and it's something that's fundamental and directly affects the basic definition of um, what the parties are contract for. So to give you an example, both parties thought they were buying and selling uh, one tonne of grain uh, when the contract says 10 tonne. Um, in, that, in, in that case, uh, both parties have made, have made a common mistake and the mistake will render the contract void because it's a common mistake and the mistake goes to the basic definition of what they're, what they're contracting for. So mutual mistake is where the parties are at cross purposes with one another. So um, if based on the, the words or the conduct that the parties have, um, have, uh, have um, uh, exhibited, only one possible interpretation of what was agreed can be deduced, the contract will still be valid. But if there's been a mutual mistake, um, and uh, uh, either either um, either party's um, uh, uh, interpretation of what they thought they were agreeing to is possible on the words of the contract, then um, the contract will be void. Um, so, for example, if Party A thought he was buying gold that would be stored in a warehouse. And Party B, but Party B thought he was selling shares in a in a gold mutual fund, not physical gold itself. Um, then there's been a mutual mistake there. And if if both those interpretations of what the what was being bought and sold are possible objectively on the wording of the of the contract, say if the contract says something like an interest in gold or something like that, which could mean either then there's been a mutual mistake, uh, either possible interpretation as possible on the terms of the contract and the contract's void. Um, so the final, the final kind of mistake is unilateral mistake. So this is where one party is mistaken and the other party knows or ought to have known of the other party's mistake. So and provided the mistake relates to something that's uh, fundamental to the contract, then the contract can be voided. So this is the kind of situation where party B knows of party A's mistake and dupes him into signing the contract anyway. Um, again, there isn't re a real agreement there. There isn't a real meeting of minds because one party has taken advantage of the other, the other party's mistaken belief of what they were agreeing. And so the contract isn't considered legitimate and the courts won't enforce it. Um, but you know, with this, with this kind of, especially this kind of unilateral mistake, it can be very difficult to prove. It's very difficult to prove that party B knew of party A's mistake, um, since and basically unless party B admits that. If, if party B doesn't admit that, then you'll need to be able to point to some document, some contemporaneous document, some email, something like that at the time that shows that party B was aware that party A was laboring under a mistake. And so it's going to be, it's going to be a very difficult thing to prove most of the time.
So all of these arguments are complicated and there's usually room for different views. And so if you're trying to attack a contract on the basis that there's been some kind of mistake, then it usually makes sense to put the argument as many um, different ways as possible and hope one of them, one of them sticks. So th there are, and I've listed a few there on the slide, there are some other options um, other than the common law doctrine of mistake. So um, there, there's a separate concept uh, called rectification. Um, and this is a, a, um, a remedy, an equitable remedy for correcting mistakes made in, record, in the recording of agreements. So by its nature, rectification is only applicable in the case of written contracts. It's really about basically if there's been a typo or, or something like that in the, in the writing down of the agreement. Um, and... Uh, uh, if, if, the, um, if the parties agree to rectification, then they can correct their mistake by entering into a deed of rectification. But otherwise it, it's necessary to apply to the court for an order for rectification. And the burden of proof is on the party seeking rectification who must be able to provide convincing proof that the agreement doesn't reflect the intentions of the parties and the, the written agreement as rectified will reflect those intentions. intentions. So another way of approaching this is um, as, some, as some of you will know, um, contracts, uh, um, there are, in order for there to be a binding legal contract under English law, there are some essential ingredients. So the key elements of an enforceable contract in, under English law are agreement, uh, um, uh, certainty, consideration, and intention to create legal relations. And for some contracts, some uh, required formality like execution as a deed. Um, but rather than that there's arguing that there's been a common law mistake of one of the, the kind that I've described um, so far, um, you may be able to argue that there was never a contract in the first place because one of the essential ingredients of the contract is missing. For example, you might be able to argue that there's um, uh, insufficient certainty as to the terms of the contract. Um, and that might be another way of putting, putting your argument, or you might be able to argue that there is no agreement because there was no offer and no acceptance of, of an offer that was communicated. So that's just another way of putting, putting the argument that might be helpful. Finally, there's also the, um, the common law doctrine of mistake. Um, it, does, it doesn't deal with, sorry, the common law uh, doctrine of mistake deals with the making of contracts. It doesn't, it doesn't cover the position of parties who have, um, by some mistake, made a payment uh, or taken some um, action um, after the contract was made. So um, it, the, it, the contracts, uh, common law doctrine of mistake is not going to help you if you accidentally pay somebody for something thinking, thinking it had been delivered when it hadn't, for example. But there, there is still the possibility of a claim under the law of restitution, which could be available in, um, in that kind of case. Uh, restitution is about reversing cases of unjust enrichment. And one of the recognised categories where enrichment of one party may be unjust is where um, they've been um, enriched as a result of a mistake, such as in the case of the mistaken payment. So that's an alternative way of, of arguing things as well. So in conclusion, um, it's possible, but very unusual in practice for a contract to be void from the beginning because of a mistake. The courts generally, for policy reasons, prefer to uphold the contract and adjust the party's obligations through the way they interpret the terms of the contract or by implying terms into the contract. Um, but it is still worth considering running a mistake argument sometimes if, if there is a mistake in the background as to how the contract was made. Even if it's rare for the courts to void contracts due to mistakes, it may still have settlement value to include the argument and, uh, um, and try to get some, some leverage uh, with the other side. And if you do run a mistake type argument, then make sure that you cover all the possibilities, include all the different types of arguments, is the more arguments you, 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 you can um, sustainably run, the greater the chance of one of them sticking. Okay, so over to you, Mark. Okay, um, I think we're at an end. I think we're slightly overrunning. So I think, um, Eric, I'll, I'll probably just take these two very quick questions, which are in the Q&A box, if that's okay, and, and we'll follow up with the, the people that have asked other questions afterwards. So uh, there's a question here of what, what, is a non, what do I mean by non-reliance clause? So that was the point I was talking about, trying to limit uh, 
uh, misrepresentation clause, uh, sorry, misrepresentation claims, and, and all effectively non-reliance clauses or that type of language that you see in boilerplate where effectively you state uh, that basically the parties have relied, so the, the parties have not relied on any statement other than what's been uh, included in the contract for the purpose of entering into the agreement. Effectively, what you, you're trying to cover off any statements that were made pre-contract, which aren't actually specified in the contract to try and limit any misrepresentation claim. And then the, the second question is just a quick one about are there examples of where the, the, these exclusion of liability clauses have, have meant that misrep claims have failed? Um, sorry, where misrep claims have succeeded, on the, even though there's these um, exclusion uh, language type clauses. And I was just trying to sort of wrap my way, wrap head around when Eric was um, running through mistake, but the one that immediately comes to mind was there was a case about about two years ago involving Nottingham Forest, and basically that was a claim for misrep on the basis of um, a Excel sheet that had been uploaded into a data room, um, which was said to actually underrepresent the debt levels of the business. And so effectively what um, the, the buyer of the club tried to do was brought, bring a misrep claim against the seller. And the master uh, originally uh, rejected the claim on the basis that there was an entire agreement clause there. And so wasn't happy that any misrepresentation of information in the data room would suffice to bring a misrep claim because of that entire agreement clause. But that was rejected by the high court and the, the master's decision was overturned on the basis that the uh, the language of the entire agreement clause itself was unambiguous. So it was ambiguous, sorry, as to whether or not it covered misrepresentation claims. So it just shows that if you're going to bring an entire run of defence on an entire agreement clause or a non-reliance clause, just make sure that it's absolutely clear what it is that you're trying to cover. Uh, I think the the courts in this area tend to, where, where, where clauses are ambiguous, they tend to uh, apply the contra preferentum rule, which effectively means that they'll hold it against the party that's trying to rely upon um, the, the wording of the, of the clause. Um, I'm conscious that we're sort of slightly over time there, Eric. Shall we uh, maybe close it there? We'll yeah. Thank you very much for everybody for joining. Um, again, there's our contact details if you do want to get in contact with us. Um, we are going to take a break over August, uh, but we'll be back in September and October. Um, I think dates in the diary have already been sent out, but uh, if, I'm sure if you're on this call, you'll receive an email with those. Um, I think my colleagues, uh, Richard and Jacob, are going to look at warranty claims in the context of share purchase agreements in September. And then Eric and I in October are going to try and re revisit um, basically jurisdiction clauses again in light of the recent announcement that it looks like we definitely won't be joining Lugano. And so therefore we have to fall back on the Hague Convention. Uh, I think for any of you that deal with uh, overseas counterparties, that'll be a particularly important session for you. But thank you very much uh, and stay safe. And, um, and thank you very much. Thank Take you care. very much, everybody. Thank you.